Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 634. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is November 5th, 2020. Or is it November 4th, 2020? Oh boy. How about December? That that would be even better. (laughs) It's December 4th, 2020. You want to do that again or should we let it fly? (laughs) No, I I think we should do that again. Uh, If we can't get that right, no one's going to believe anything we say. (laughs) Your credibility went way out the window. Three, two, one. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Friday edition, the free-for-all edition, episode 634. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is December 4th, 2020. All right, welcome to Friday's show. This is kind of a free-for-all because George and I are recovering. I'm recovering from Thanksgiving and uh, having my my rig work done here at the Cummings Sales and Service Facility in Orlando, Florida. And uh, Jill is recovering. Jill, George is recovering mm-hmm. because his wife has finally returned from her travels uh, in Washington. And uh, uh, life is getting back to normal for both of us in this recovery time. But before we get to all that... You as faithful viewers, the wonderful people we love and do this show for, you you need to help us out. And you can do that by doing what we call free advertising. And that's liking us on Facebook, liking, clicking the, the like button on YouTube, subscribing to the channel if you're not subscribed yet. And geez, you guys are the best commenters ever. And you already know that, but please go to the comment section and add your comments. We got lots of comments on George's uh, sabbatical opinion from the last uh, show, and that was a lot of fun to read. Uh, <laughs> you guys have lots of good opinions, and uh, we really, really appreciate all that. This show goes far beyond just the, the half hour we sit down recording it. Yeah, the show we expect lasts for weeks and weeks, and we watch that as uh, the viewership per episode goes up. Uh, we get about 70% of the views per episode in the first week. The other 30% happens over the next three weeks or four weeks. Some people you forgot about Unscripted. Oh, oh I've got to go watch them. Some people um, just uh, don't watch us frequently uh, on a regular basis. And some of you watch us as soon as I click the publish button. We get the, the 30 or 40 you know, really hardcore viewers. And we understand all of you. And we're glad that you watch the program, and we give thanks for you. This show would not exist uh, if not for the viewership. We really appreciate that. All right, I know I spent too much time talking about that. Uh, oh, we're only two minutes in. I could talk about you guys more, but I'm not going to. George, your dear wife has returned. How you doing? Exhausted. Uh, I did not realize I was under such stress because she was away. I was so excited to see her. Picked her up at 10.30 at the airport in Orlando on Monday. And essentially, I've been asleep ever since. Uh, just the stress of worrying about her and my children as they're away. Oh, the, my wife and two children driving through the mountains, and the Cascade Mountains, in the snow, having fun. Where all I can think of is the uh, sort of wreck at the bottom of a ravine and all this stuff. Oh, yeah. my. I texted. Why have they text back? Why is my wife ghosting me? Why my kids won't return my text? Yeah, absolutely. No, I know. Uh, you and I travel uh, long distances, and there's always that compartment in your brain that wonders what's happening back home. Are they okay? Did the house burn down? You know, because you're not there monitoring it. And um, that's just, that's human nature. So Who's going to set the VCR clock? Uh. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> So I mentioned before that uh, we had some service done this week at the uh, uh, Cummings. It, it's a funny story. We came here to get a new uh, fuel pump put in the generator and get the uh, just some basic maintenance that you have to have when you hit 1,000 hours on the generator, which we hit. And so we were here overnight uh, in their free campground. Free is good. And I go to start the, the, the diesel motor, the, the big motor in back, the next morning to pull it up to the garage. And it was that 35 degree morning, George. You remember that? Okay. Yes. <laughs> and and all, I, 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 it starts humming and brrr, like a diesel motor should. And then I hear a pop. And then just everything shuts down. Well, that's not good. 
So I try to start it again. It just won't start. So I call the shop and say, okay, I, I'm across the street over here in the campground, and I can't get the motor started. Oh, we'll come on over. And over the course of two days, they fixed the generator. They fixed the, uh, the Cummings motor. I didn't have to call a tow truck. All this happened right here on Cummings. Uh, a lot so it, you know they just came right out to the campground which is across the street and it was it was the perfect situation for my first breakdown so we'll see how this goes not too expensive i was thinking we're going to walk out of here broke but uh, uh they make all their money off the fire trucks they're servicing the buses um, they have all these contracts with big rigs uh, they don't need to make a lot of money from us camper people. So it was kind of kind of neat to see that. We should move on to the news, George. People are like, come on already. It's five minutes into the show. News. What's going on in the world? Um, lots. I don't know where you want to start. Well, I think we'll start on the bigger picture because it, it, it's impacting uh, so many of our viewers. Um, we're going through another wave of shutdowns uh, last Yesterday, the Diocese of Episcopal Diocese of Mississippi shut down services. This is followed by shutdowns from central New York to some Canadian dioceses. Um, in North America, we're have, seeing a new wave of, sh of lockdowns. Where, um, and in the civil world, political world, California has, by, for all intents and purposes, uh, rolled up the shutters. Yeah. Now, now here in Florida. Uh, Nothing has happened, but the the, the knock-on effect has been uh, we restarted, my parish restarted in-person services, and we've been, if you add up all the services during the day, we're about, we were about 30% uh, where we were this time last year. Well, with this vaccine on the horizon and with this second uh, wave of sickness passing through the country, we have collapsed in attendance. Um, we're probably now at 10 percent of where we were this time last year and i talked to some people and the what i'm hearing is that well we were coming to church because there looked like no end inside of this we just needed to get on with our lives and if we're going to get sick we're going to get sick if we weren't we weren't but now with the vaccine on the horizon it would be foolish to get sick now just before the end is near so this it, well, I, I know people will be very surprised to hear this, but clergy are people too, and they have a sense of uh, when their services are full, they feel better than when they're empty. Absolutely. And when they're empty, you can say, well, gosh, I really shouldn't preach on uh, on uh, transubstantiation anymore <laughs> <Really>? or penal <laughs> substitutionary atonement. In other words, I know when I've made some mistakes about topics or things, I'm being silly. But okay. this is nothing that a minister can do to turn the situation around. But at the same time, the online services uh, are exploding in different ways. We have a, I offer a ten, seven minute Compline service, seven days a week at 10 o'clock, and that now has a greater viewership than my Sunday morning services. Um, I don't understand, I'm trying to understand the dynamics of this changing environment. What are people looking for in worship? How is this working for them? Well, um, what is not working? And I don't have the answers. Oh, I, I do. To my satisfaction. Because I'm a technology freak. Uh, what I'm noticing now is people have two churches. They have their local church and they have their virtual church. And on Sunday morning when the live stream of their uh, local church happens, they will attend it, say hi on Facebook to everybody, give the peace at the peace time, ask for prayers during the prayer time in the comments and stuff like that. But then they have their virtual church that they want to they go to where they have their uh, favorite preacher or their favorite music or their favorite, you know, whatever. And uh, they are basically attending at least two services or a, or a, a service and a half on Sunday morning one to get the the preaching they really really want and uh, two to keep up with the local uh church as well our church went back into um no in-person services again they'll they'll record the feed they'll have uh the service at the church but it's just gonna be live streamed and the second wave is going to once again bring churches to the point where they have to rely on that technology 
and they're not going to be relying on the numbers. And it's hard for a preacher or a clergyman to look out over there in your Sunday worship service and see nobody. Because how do you deliver a sermon in that? How do you get the facial feedback? How do you get the, well, you know, preaching to a lens, which is what we're doing right here, talking to the lens, is very difficult. I get feedback from George when I'm talking because he's nodding his head. And I can see him right here on the screen. Yes, Kevin, you're right on topic. You're doing good. Oh, no, Kevin, that's about, oh, Kevin, stop, stop, Kevin. You, you don't get that in your services anymore because there's nobody in the pews. That's very difficult, George. And it's also, this is a tremendous challenge for me to the whole nature of the institutional church. Um, what do I need a diocese for at this time? I've not had any, in other words, I always thought a bishop sort of acted towards his clergy the way a priest acts towards his parishioner. You're right. involved in their life, you pray for them, you support them, you check in with them. I've not heard from my bishop since this all started. I've not had any, uh, I get these missives from the diocesan office about what you can and can't do, uh, but there's no sense of being part of a wider community. My wider fellowship, uh, faith fellowship, is with people from different denominations, people from different uh, traditions, some in some inside my tradition, some outside, but it is certainly not in the traditional geographical hierarchical sense. And we're seeing so that uh, authority is now being, uh, you know, we're in the middle of our pledge drive right now. And it's, it's for me, uh, stress inducing because will people give uh, based on the old way of doing church when we no longer do the old way of doing church. Well, the diocese is also putting its budget together for next year. And why, And I have to ask myself, what am I getting in return for the thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 we kick upstairs? I get a visit from the bishop every two to three years uh, to do confirmations. And th the whole... Uh, the world is changing, and the old ways just are not going to work anymore. It's, uh, it, no, I, I well, agree. That, as of my perspective this morning. Well, sure, but dioceses at this, in lockdowns, are handcuffed about what they can do and can't do. A lot of their staff are elderly. A lot of the bishops are elderly. They don't want to go out and lay hands on people and stuff like that because they don't want to get the COVID. And it's just one of those strange situations. But here's the thing you know we've got some bishops who are doing quite well in other words uh, for instance foley beach does his recorded uh those he does his recorded minutes uh or he, he does little, his little podcast and he but he's also podcast. he's visiting churches and he's installing priests and doing that's yeah you know. <clears throat> in other words he's keeping a profile he's keeping he's being on message mm -hmm. he's being in other words from a from my perspective uh, I like him as a man anyway, so it's actually fun to be able to compliment him professionally. Professionally, he has been able to rise to meet the, ch the unique challenge that we're in by providing online content as well as personal content as well as letting people know what he's doing. If you have a quiet or shy bishop who's not really tech savvy, the, the result is my frustrations of the way the world goes can find an outlet by saying, well, why can't the bishop fix this or help me? Because he doesn't know what to do either. Sure. Now, yeah. he, uh, why should he know what to do? Because right. they don't teach this in seminary. There's no live streaming class yet in seminary or podcasting. Actually, I think Trinity started a podcasting class. But there's no uh, technical uh, tech-based communications taught at the seminary level so i don't expect bishops to to be able to turn on a computer go to facebook click the live camera button and, and give a talk or an encouraging word uh, i see that certainly the, the dean of uh, anic does um uh, charlie masters uh, gives frequent updates uh archbishop foley beats gives his updates but this is a, a time for the leadership the the higher ranking leadership within the church to reassess their role within uh, diocesan relationships. I, I agree with you that this is kind of handcuffed bishops and others who can't travel when there's waves, who can't go uh, from church to church because right now uh, churches in most dioceses are, are closing again because of the second wave. 
how do they reassess the relationship with the church? And the secular world is also cocking uh, its nose at the church world. In, in the Church of England, we have uh, Nigel Nigel Farage. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to pronounce his last name perfectly. Farage, Farage. Farage, Farage. I think it's Farage. The uh, head of the Brexit movement, he's sort of a maverick politician. Mm -hmm. And just by saying his name, half, the, half of our English audience will turn off right now because they can't stand him. <laughs> Other half will think it's wonderful. But he had a very spirited attack against the government of Boris Johnson and the lockdown regulations. And then he went and continued on to the Church of England of being absent from the battle of its leadership. Uh, he, he said, you know, there's a marvelous clergy doing great things in this time of pandemic across the spectrum. But the bishops have just been dreadful. They've been missing an action once again. And that complaint resonates with me. And here we've got someone who's not religious, who's uh, pinpointing a, a problem that our leadership uh, is evincing. Again, this is not a universal. There are people, uh, uh, Kevin has called out, uh, called up for praise Charlie Masters, and I've mentioned Fully Beach, and there are others who I will be embarrassed having left their names out. Um, so, I mean, if there are people you want to praise, bishops you want to praise in the comments, do so. Yeah, put them in the comments. But, if your diocese but, is working right now functionally and your bishop is and you're suffering, please put them in the comments so that we become aware of it. But as a, as a, and it's a structural institution, things aren't working anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of the truth of COVID. We're now into our second wave we should learn how to make it work. This is our second chance. Everything's closing down. Church, what have you learned from the first wave? Apply it to the second wave. And eh, it'll be interesting to see how this, this works because now people do have the hope for the vaccine. There's a vaccine on the horizon. Um, it's, you know, depending on which one you get, between 90 to 95% effective, um, which is basically the same as the flu shot. So um, we shall see. And... You know, these are the strangest times. You know, we, we still, there's still fighting going on over the election. I, I watched a video from the mayor of Austin, who right before Thanksgiving was asking his citizens to stay home. Please don't go out and spread this virus uh, to your, your family during Thanksgiving. And we found out he was recording that from the beaches of Mexico where he was attending his daughter's wedding. <laughs> Just like <laughs> the you know, the hypocrisy that's going on right now between the government and its citizen. It, 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 I'm sure it's been worse at other times, but this is just Orwellian. You know? What is what is so funny for me is that this is a Simpson episode. <laughs> In 1993, right. we had the Simpsons episode of the Osaka flu, which is devastating uh, Springfield. And Mayor Quimby does a public service announcement about being safe, stay home, get well. And he's actually in Mexico on vacation or the Caribbean. I mean, this is this, this could be this, this cartoon uh, is prescient in describing politicians today. Well, if 2020 is anything, it's the, the year of satire. When satire became nonfiction, when satire became real, you can make up any story right now, it's satirical as it, it, you, you may want to make it sound, and all of a sudden, oh, no, that's not satire, that's real. It really happened. So, uh, you know, there's a terrible, terrible story. Uh, let's just make this a downer episode. Okay. Um, when I was a little boy in the suburbs of Philadelphia, before we moved to Florida, one of the local Episcopal priests was a man named George Rutler at Good Shepherd Rosemont. Father Rutler, uh, in 19, uh, 1979, entered the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, he was one of the first of that wave of Episcopalians received uh, uh, under John Paul II's leader, pontificate. Mm -hmm. uh, George Rutler is a charismatic, extraordinary man. He's written 30 books. He's well-educated. He's urbane. He is uh, just the picture of an Anglo-Catholic priest at its best. And 
Well, uh, he has a weekly show on EWTN. Um, and for the last uh, 20 years, he's been the rector of St. Michael's Catholic Church in Manhattan. Well, New News 12, New York City news station, reported on the 26th of November that uh, Father Rutler uh, allegedly molested a woman at church. And uh, the story... The security guard. Yeah, that's right. A female security guard. Yeah. And the story is pretty... <sighs> Well, this, the story in a nutshell, the allegation is that on the eve of the on election night, the security guard, uh, a woman, 23-year-old woman, uh, took a break from her rounds and was sitting in the office texting her mother when Father Rutler came in. And he went over to his computer. He may not have been aware that she was there. And he started watching the election returns. Then he switched to watching homosexual pornography. She filmed... Uh, this incident, she claims. And she's given to the Catholic news agency a film showing from behind a man in a church office, balding, who from behind resembles Father Rutler. And those who know his office and those who know him well can probably say whether it's him or not. She, as she attempted to leave, he saw her, jumped up, slammed the door, and she claims that he tried to, she, he tried to grab at her breasts. Uh, she escaped and texted her mother that she had just escaped a rape. And the art, Father Rutler on the 20th of November released a letter to the parish saying that this accusations of misconduct has been made. He denies it, but he's stepping down while it's under investigation. And the district attorney's office in Manhattan is investigating. Now, John Carapi was one of the mega stars of traditional Catholicism. Uh, just he led retreats he was on the radio I enjoyed his sermons I didn't agree with some of his theology mm -hmm. but man this guy was great J uh, just like George Rutler in a different style and if George Rutler goes down this will be a tragedy uh, just a tragedy for the Anglo-Catholic movement and for traditional Catholicism yeah I mean it's just I mean what else can happen in 2020 I mean Rutler it was one of the unblemished heroes, and now this whole, you know, it's, if it's true, what can you say? No. That Satan is real and it's a lion prowling around seeking to devour us. Uh -huh. Oh, my. Which is true. I mean, uh, I would say in 2020, in this age, uh, pornography is devouring many uh, Christians and many uh, people trying to uh, hold it together. Pornography uh, changes the brain, changes the the, the, the dynamic of addiction, um, and it's a, a new addiction. We, we don't have as many smokers now, but we have many people addicted to porn, and um, it's just one of those horrible things. I want to talk about the progressive Methodist group that announced the formation of the Liberation Methodist Connection (LMX). George. Uh, liberation or liberal what is it it says liberation is it l e yeah l e b e r a t i o n liberation okay yeah i'm pretty sure i thought it stood for loser methodist <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it's the one denomination uh, in a press document linked on its web website lmx calls itself a grassroots denomination the first methodist denomination committed to being intentional Here's the acronym, LGBTQIA2, the numeral two, S plus affirming, and centered in liberating intersexual justice ministries. So this is a new denomination faction uh, coming out of the United Methodist Church good for them oh boy well we had reported no good for them that they have the integrity because the their traditional church will not accept what they stand for yeah. and rather than seeking to change an apple into an orange they go out and do what they think is right rather than try to poison the pond for everybody else well i think for the longest time there was in the last six years there was a building split within the united mm -hmm. methodist church and 2020 took away that opportunity for a split they weren't able to have their convention and these people uh, said in their statement that we are 
respecting the timeline of the Holy Spirit uh, is driving our decision to launch LMX at this moment, and we are responding to that call," said Alethea Miller. And I'm sorry, but LMX is another unfortunate acronym like GAFCON, which was GAFCON was definitely not made up by a marketing guru. No. <laughs> LMX either sounds like a train. Co- a railroad in the United States or a child's mountain bike. Uh, it doesn't have that churchy feel to it. It doesn't know. Uh, well, it's the 21st century. It does have the LGTBQ. Uh, I'll never get the whole acronym. The acronym keeps changing, and I apologize for people. I'm not trying to be insensitive. I'm trying to point out the obvious. But, but you know, this... I, I applaud this move because it's it's honest. It's truthful. Yeah. It you know They're taking things... I don't agree with anything that they've stated in their statement. I don't think the mission of the church is the justice that they're proclaiming. I think it's proclaiming Jesus Christ. That's me. That's mm-hmm. them. But in within the Church of England, we saw Colin Coward, a friend of this show, even though he won't admit it, and uh, about two dozen other leaders of the Kevin, will you recite those letters again for me? I don't remember them all. <laughs> of the LGBTQIA two S plus, but they don't. The Colin Coward's group doesn't recognize three of those letters. That's their, terrible. I know, and they're present. So, well, the this group of uh, uh, gay and lesbian Anglicans and their supporters have called upon two or three dozen bishops of the Church of England whom they identify as being pro-gay and that goes from uh, Alan Wilson uh, in Buckingham who's the only one who's loudly that way to the new Archbishop of York Stephen Cottrell to actually make take a stand and go ahead bless same-sex unions go out on the go go out and stand for what they believe instead of staying in lockstep with the institution and because they're not going to take it anymore they've just been frustrated by the delay and the obfuscation and the fights and they and if these bishops and privately are telling them that, that they agree with them they support them they're working for them why can't they do this publicly so though i may disagree with the trajectory and with uh, not the trajectory with the message that is being said i agree entirely with colin's point that these men and and women need to be honest and preach and teach what they believe not just knuckle under to the conformity of the institution no and that's the, the important point here is for the longest time there's been the wink and nod uh, doctrine within the, the, the Church of England. Yes, the official teaching of the Church of England is that same-sex uh, marriage and same-sex uh, uh, relationships are wrong and cannot be blessed or uh, sanctified. That's to the official teaching of the Church of England. However, for pastoral reasons, uh, bishop to bishop and clergy to clergy, we can make arrangements. Nod, nod, wink, wink. And that's been done for many years. Now you're being called out. Those people you've nod, nodded and winked, winked to want results. And you now have to take a stand or you're going to be outed as pro-gay or outed as gay. Now there are uh, same-sex attracted, afflicted bishops within the Church of England who've not taken a stand either. Have not said, oh, by the way, I have that going on. The, more life. than more than that, Kevin. There are uh, there are those who are partnered. Yeah. There are those who uh, make you know those who know them know that they're partnered. There's been a long-standing story that two bishops within the Church of England are partnered to each other. They may not have a civil union, but they are a couple. Uh, we've there was a story in Private Eye that. Yeah. Uh, a few months ago where one of the bishops of a northern english industrial city was accused of uh living with a uh, a young man 30 years his junior who was basically it was your typical you know older gay man with his uh, paramour story yeah. a bit and the the diocese uh I wrote, sent, do you have any comment? And they wrote, no, we don't have any comment. The bishop's on vacation. And the bishop wrote back, 
well, this is totally unfounded. He sent me a message, said, totally unfounded, totally untrue. We're just friends. And I just didn't want to go dive any deeper because it was obvious that he was obvi obfuscating. But what point would it serve uh, and the libel laws being such as they are? No, unless it, I was going to break into their room with a camera, why would I want to go even further? It, it but is, in other words, there are bishops who everybody, I don't want to say everybody knows, but those with uh, in the inner circle know. Who take the nod, nod, and wink, wink too far. Yes, absolutely. And and here's here, uh, the, the pro if I were to respond in Colin, to Colin Coward's uh, arguments uh, from a strategic point of view, rather than address the issue that he's propounding, I would say, Colin, just hold on. For instance, the Church of England is patting itself on the shoulder for appointing an evangelical as suffragan bishop of Dorchester in the Diocese of Oxford. I think I, I, we bursted a, vess a vessel. He's not evangelical. Well, he is the leader of the Evangelical Forum on General Synod. Well, what doesn't that sound good? Well, the Evangelical Forum on General Synod split off from the Evangelical Group on General Synod when the evangelical group objected to the whole gay agenda. The evangelical forum is the splinter group of a splinter group who is pro-gay. So Welby has appointed a pro-gay evangelical bishop as Bishop of Dorchester. And over time, uh, you know, if you ask them, Welby would say he's evangelical. Michael Curry would say he's evangelical. We would not understand them to be evangelical in the way we would consider ourselves evangelical but hey you, one of the things we learned about transgenderism is that you can determine your sex and your churchmanship by Absolutely. your own words yeah uh george well i'm trans uh millionaire i've been working on being a trans millionaire i want to walk into bank of america and have them recognize me as the millionaire i think i am hoping <laughs> so we're hoping i bought tesla stock it may happen anyway oh all right any other news you want to talk about or are we gonna let people get back to their friday uh work and have a good weekend just things are miserable in nigeria oh, that's true yeah um that that's a hard story t to read because you know as long as you and i have been in anglican news business uh, the African nations have been uh, suffering tremendously from uh, the influences of radical Islam, the Boko Haram, uh, and other um, just terrorist and, and deadly groups, and it's not ending. And now it's, it's continuing at a greater extent when the whole world and the whole news media is focused on Trump and the election and COVID, they're going around and slaughtering farmers in North Nigeria. The, the problems Nigeria is facing right now as a nation, they've got, they've had some really, they've had some weather catastrophes, uh, flooding and rains, and and the state is not able to step in. Uh, it's not like uh, Louisiana and New Orleans after that Hurricane Katrina where the government comes in and rebuilds. Uh, you're on your own. So second, we've got separatist agitation where the the oil producing regions are down in the delta and those with the memory for this may remember the biafran war of the 1960s when that part of nigeria seceded from the federal republic and wanted to become its own country because of its nationalism and tribal instance and they basically were sick of having the muslim generals to keep all the money that was being pumped out of the gr their ground well the agitation is returning and the federal government is basically me making a mess of it such that we had a bishop, Bishop Akiakur, one of the Anglican bishops in that area, saying, look, if you want to restart the Biafra War, uh, this is how you go about doing it, where the locals feel that they are being oppressed by foreigners, the foreigners being this case, House of Muslim Nigerians from the north. Then you've got the Muslim insurgency. Uh, which we've described on this page where another hundred people were killed in the last month uh farmers uh villagers and the army 
people are saying is either complicit or turns a blind eye or does nothing and the army's controlled by the muslim generals i would say all three of those are the same thing but okay you know uh, it just it, it's astonishing so, we're in the 21st century george and nobody re respects life and uh, it's so disheartening having you and i visited all those countries to see these these wars rage out and then the and then in the main cities uh, lagos and abuja we've had riots and civil unrest because of police brutality there's uh it's called sars just like the i think it's sars yeah. special action riot squad i think whatever the acronym stands for there's a police unit that deals with uh major it's it's a swat team of sorts but a national swat agency and they are quite brutal and the collapsing economy the terrible political and social unrest is finding an outlet in young unemployed you know with an unemployment rate for the young approaching 50 percent in some of the cities they come out into the streets to demonstrate against police heavy handedness and violence and it's we need to pray for the church of nigeria and the people in nigeria because it's a really desperately it's a failed government failed state but it's approaching it's not somalia yet but if it keeps on this trajectory this is where somalia wound up yeah it's not somalia uh but boy it's becoming sudan real quick you know it, once again it's hard to watch keep nigeria keep all of uh east africa in your prayer in this time um the world but is here's, here's a COVID. funny thing yeah. uh, it, in sudan it can come back uh, two years ago, a Christian church in Omdurman, which is across the river from Khartoum in the capital. Khartoum is the capital. Omdurman is across the river, across the Nile. A Christian church has burned the ground. And under the new government, they're now investigating, and there are three men on trial for the destruction of a Christian church. This was unheard of. For 25 years, the Christians could be persecuted, murdered, their churches destroyed, and the government would do nothing. Now this new Sudanese regime, which is shortly to be established relationships with Israel, this will be another Trump coup of another Arab nation signing up to full peace with Israel. In the Sudan, in the north, they're finally doing the right thing after three or four generations of Muslim domination and tyranny answered, so we prayer. Can't turn around. <laughs> answered prayer in sudan all right george i want to thank you for your friday time um uh you and susan enjoy your time together um i don't know if people know this people who follow you on facebook saw that you just bought your wife a brand new car what a what a great husband you are uh, I felt like Bob Barker. A oh, new car. <laughs> That's great. So, yes, but, uh, our viewers long term know that I love tinkering on cars, and uh, who can forget the story of the cat eating the O-rings and the transmission as I had it on the floor of the garage? Uh, well, that I finally tra I traded in that car and two other cars, and with. Uh, and then took out a small loan and was able to buy my wife a brand new car. Oh, good. This way, I've told her it's going to be titled in my name, so that if you ever leave me again, <laughs> I'm yanking that car away. <laughs> but no, keep, keep that cute dog too. Yeah. So, well, I thought you wanted to borrow it to clean up your uh, cat throw up. I mean, it's I one of the it's things just... he does well is to eat <sighs> cat throw up. I have Sky. Skyler got the flu yesterday. He probably has cat COVID or something, but he's walking around and you, you, well, it jacks. And he's done that like about a dozen times today. And if you go back early uh, to make the three or four minute mark of the show, you'll hear a cat barfing in the background. That's Skyler, the barfing cat. George was telling me he has a dog that solves the problem. He watches the cat throw up, runs over, and cleans up. Daddy doesn't have to do anything. It's so cool. And then he comes over and looks your face. <laughs> okay, we have grossed out the viewers. We have depressed the viewers. Please, viewers, go to the comment section. Let us know if your diocese is working. 
uh, if your bishop is is uh, able to to conquer the, the the tech issues in covid um this is we're re re-entering a hard time the vaccine is on the horizon but our hope is not in the vaccine our hope is not in the church our hope is in christ i want you guys to remember that please it's not in the numbers george yeah remember that and remember people are picking two churches they're picking a virtual church or they're picking their local church Pick Pick george. <laughs> i'm kevin Carlson, and i'm george conger and you've been watching episode 634 of anglican unscripted